Part 1 You will hear a man phoning the customer services manager of a hotel to get information about holding a conference there. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Flanders Conference Hotel. Oh, hi. I wanted to ask about conference facilities at the hotel. Have I come through to the right person? Mm -hmm, you have. I'm the customer services manager. My name's Angela. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm calling from Barrett & Stanson's. We're a medical company based in Perth. Oh, yes? And we're organising a conference for our clients to be held in Sydney. It'll be held over two days and we're expecting about 50 or 60 people. When were you thinking of having it? Sometime early next year, like the end of January. It'd have to be a weekend. Ah, uh, let me see. Our conference facilities are already booked for the weekend beginning January the 28th. We could do the first weekend in February. How about January the 21st? Ah, uh, oh, I'm afraid that's booked too. Well, let's go for the February date then. So, that's the weekend beginning the 4th. OK. Now, can you tell me a bit about what conference facilities you have? Sure. So, for talks and presentations, we have the Tesla room. Sorry? Tesla. That's spelled T-E-S-L-A. It holds up to 100 people and it's fully equipped with a projector and so on. How about a microphone? Yes, that'll be all set up ready for you. And there'll be one that members of the audience can use too, for questions if necessary. Fine. And we'll also need some sort of open area where people can sit and have a cup of coffee. And we'd like to have an exhibition of our products and services there as well, so that'll need to be quite a big space. Mm-hmm. That's fine. There's a central atrium with all those facilities, and you can come before the conference starts if you want to set everything up. Great. And I presume there's Wi-Fi? Oh, yes. That's free and available throughout the hotel. OK. Would you also like us to provide a buffet lunch? We can do a two-course meal with a number of different options. What sort of price are we looking at for that? Well, I can send you a copy of the standard menu. That's $45 per person. Or you can have the special for $25 more. I think the standard should be OK, but yes, send me the menu. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, we're also going to need accommodation on the Saturday night for some of the participants. I'm not sure how many, but probably about 25. So what do you charge for a room? Well, for conference attendees, we have a 25% reduction. So we can offer you rooms at $135. Normally, a standard room's $180. And does that include breakfast? Sure. 
And of course, guests can also make use of all the other facilities at the hotel. So we've got a spa where you can get massages and facials and so on. And there's a pool up on the roof for the use of guests. Oh, great. Now, what about transport links? The hotel's downtown, isn't it? Yes. It's about 12 kilometres from the airport. But there's a complimentary shuttle bus for guests. And it's only about 10 minutes' walk from the central railway station. OK. Now, I don't know Sydney very well. Can you just give me an idea of the location of the hotel? Ah, uh, well, it's downtown on Wilby Street. Uh, that's quite a small street and it's not very far from the sea. And, of course, if the conference attendees want to go out on their Saturday evening, there's a huge choice of places to eat. Then, if they want to make a night of it, they can go on to one of the clubs in the area. There are a great many to choose from. OK. So, if we go ahead with this, can you give me some information about how much we're looking at? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a tour leader giving information about a bus tour. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Thank you for choosing City Tours. The reason so many people choose our tours when visiting this city is because you can design your tour to suit your own interests. Your old pass entitles you to board our bus at any stop and stay as long as you like at each place. The all-day bus pass costs $18 for adults. Children between the ages of 5 and 12 pay half the adult fare and children under 5 ride for free. Our buses run every hour on the half hour, starting at 8.30am. Our most popular tour is the Centre City Tour, which goes to all the major attractions in the centre of the city. From the starting point here at the tour bus office, the bus goes to the first stop, Hill Park. As you may guess, this park is located at the top of a small hill. The next stop is the fishing docks. Following that, the bus goes on to the third stop, Bay Bridge, located at the foot of the bridge which crosses the bay. The fourth stop is in the shopping district, then the fifth and last stop is at Green Street. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. There are many interesting things to do and see on the Centre City tour. At the first stop, you can enjoy a spectacular view of the bay, the city, and especially of the fishing docks, which are located at the foot of the hill. At the second stop, you can walk around and look at the boats. Fresh fish from the bay is also for sale here, since this is a place where the fishermen bring in their catch. 
The next stop is where some of the city's finest seafood restaurants are located, so you might want to plan a lunch stop here. You can eat fresh fish here, prepared in the traditional local way. The fourth stop is, of course, where you can do your shopping. Don't miss the opportunity to purchase some of our city's famous handmade baskets. You'll want to take several home as souvenirs of your visit to our city. Finally, at the last stop on the tour, you can visit one of the oldest buildings in our city, the theatre. This building was built over 400 years ago and is still used today as a place to see plays, musicals and other performances, as well as our annual film festival. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two biology students called Helen and Colin talking about the report they are writing on their recent field trip to a seaside area called Rocky Bay. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. I've brought my notes on our biology field trip to Rocky Bay, Colin, so we can work on our report on the research we did together. OK. I've got mine too. Let's look at the aims of the trip first. Right. What did you have? I just put something about getting experience of the different sorts of procedures used on a field trip. But we need something about what causes different organisms to choose particular habitats. I agree. And something about finding out how to protect organisms in danger of dying out. In our aims? Mm. But we weren't really looking at that. I suppose not. OK, now there's the list of equipment we all had to bring on the field trip. What did they tell us to bring a ruler for? It was something about measuring the slope of the shore. But of course we didn't need it because we were measuring wind direction and we'd brought the compass for that. But not the piece of string to hold up in the air. <laughs> didn't Mr Blake make a fuss about us leaving that behind? Yeah, he does go on. Anyway, it was easy to get one from another of the students. Now, the next section's the procedure. I sent you the draft of that. Yeah, um... It was clear, but I don't think we need all these details of what time we left and what time we got back and how we divided up the different research tasks. Mm, OK, I'll look at that again. Then we have to describe our method of investigation in detail. Mm. So let's begin with how we measured wave speed. I was surprised how straightforward that was. I'd expected us to have some sort of high-tech device not just stand there and count the number of waves per minute. <laughs> not very precise, but I suppose it was good enough. But the way we measured the amount of salt was interesting. In the water from the rock pools? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to check the chemicals we used in the lab when we analysed those samples. Uh, was it potassium chromate and silver nitrate? That's right. OK. And we need the map of the seashore. You just left that to me. And I had to do it while the tide was low. Well, that was OK, but the place I started it from was down on the beach. Then I realised I should have gone up higher to get better visibility, so I had to start all over again. But at least I'd got the squared paper, or I'd have had problems drawing it all to scale. Yeah, it looks good. We could get a map of the region off the internet, 
and see if we need to make any changes. Mm, I had a look, but I couldn't find anything. But you took some pictures, didn't you? Yeah, I'll email you them if you want. OK, I'll make my amendments using those. Then I can scan it into our report. Great! Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, when we get to our findings, I thought we could divide them up into the different zones we identified on the shore and the problems organisms face in each zone. So for the highest area... The splash zone. Yeah. We found mostly those tiny shellfish that have strong hard shells that act as protection. But not from other organisms that might eat them. Predators. No, that's not the main danger for them. But the shells prevent them from drying out because they're in the open air for most of the time. Right. And since they're exposed, they need to be able to find some sort of shelter or cover themselves up so they don't get too hot. Mm. Then in the middle and lower zones nearer the sea, we need to discuss the effects of wave action. Yes, and how organisms develop structures to prevent themselves from being swept away or even destroyed by being smashed against the rocks. Mm. I haven't done anything on the geological changes. I don't know what to put for that. Mm, no, we weren't concentrating on that. Maybe we need to find some websites. Good idea. I've got the lecture notes from Mr Blake's geology course, but they're too general. Mm. But we could ask him which books on our reading list might be most helpful. Right. OK. Now, I did a draft of the section of sources of possible error in our research, but I don't know if you agree. For example, the size of the sample and whether it's big enough to make any general conclusions from. But I thought, actually, we did have quite a big sample. We did. And our general method of observation seemed quite reliable. But we might not be all that accurate as far as the actual numbers go. Yeah, we might have missed some organisms, mm. if they were hiding under a rock, for example. Mm. I wasn't sure about the way we described their habitats. I decided it was probably OK. Yeah, and the descriptions we gave of the smaller organisms, they weren't very detailed, but they were adequate in this context. I'm not sure we identified all the species correctly, though. OK, we'd better mention that. Now... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a professor give a lecture on Louisa May Alcott. First, you have some time to look at the questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the timeline in questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today I'd like to continue our discussion of the lives of prominent American writers by talking about Louisa May Alcott, one of the best-known 19th century writers. Alcott is known for her moralistic girls' novels, but she was a much more serious individual than those novels might lead one to believe. She was born in 1832, the daughter of Bronson Alcott, who was one of the founders of the Transcendentalist movement. Bronson Alcott was a philosopher, but not a provider. 
and the family lived close to poverty. From an early age, Louisa was determined to find a way to improve her family's economic situation. As a teenager, she worked to support her family by taking on a variety of low-paying jobs, including teacher, seamstress, and household servant. Alcott also started writing when she was young. She wrote her first novel when she was just 17 years old, although it wasn't published until many years after her death. It was called The Inheritance. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. Alcott worked as a volunteer, sewing uniforms and bandages for soldiers. The following year, she enlisted as an army nurse. She spent the war years in Washington, nursing woundeders at a military hospital. While working at the hospital, she wrote many letters to her family at home in Massachusetts. After the war, she turned the letters into a book, which was published under the title Hospital Sketches. She also wrote numerous romantic stories, which she sold to magazines. Around this same time, she was offered the opportunity to travel to Europe as the companion to an invalid. When she returned home from Europe in 1866, she found her family still in financial difficulty and in need of money. So she went back to writing. Her big break came in 1868, with the publication of her first novel for girls, Little Women. The novel achieved instant success, and the public wanted more. From then on, Alcott supported herself and her family by writing novels for girls. It wasn't the writing she had dreamed of doing, but it earned her a good income. Alcott took, Alcott took care of her family for the rest of her life. In 1878, her youngest sister, May, got married. A year later, May died after giving birth to a daughter. Louisa Alcott raised her sister's orphaned child. In 1882, Bronson Alcott suffered a stroke. Soon after that, Louisa Alcott set up a house for him, her niece, her sister Anna, and Anna's two sons in Boston. Her mother was no longer living by this time. Alcott was still writing novels for girls, including two sequels to Little Women, Little Men and Joe's Boys. The latter was published in 1886. Louisa Alcott had suffered poor health ever since she contracted typhoid fever while working as a war nurse. She died in March of 1888, at the age of 55. She was buried in Concord, Massachusetts. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Here's a tighter version, IELTS listening mistakes and how to fix them. Focus on instructions. Read question types carefully for what info to listen for. Predict, but don't overthink. Use context to guess answers, but stay flexible. Stay concentrated. Don't miss the rest if you miss an answer. Ignore distractors. Focus on key details, not irrelevant info. Listen for synonyms. Answers might be rephrased. Take notes. Transfer later. Don't write on the answer sheet while listening. Guess if unsure. No penalty for wrong answers. Check spelling and grammar. Crucial for completion questions. Practice with timed tests. Many resources available online and in prep books. Listen to natural English. Podcasts. Shows. Audiobooks improve overall listening. Optimizing your test day performance.